Okay, so the question we want to consider in this video is what is the shortest path between two points on a surface? Now let's start with the very simple case, which is a plane. So on a plane, I think you ask anyone in the street and they will know the answer. What is the shortest path between two points? It's a straight line. Take this point here, this point here. Consider all the possible paths that take me from there to there. And a four-year-old would probably understand that the shortest path is the straight line. Now, we all know that it's the straight line. You might think about, how would you show that? In other words, can you prove it? That's not so trivial, you say, uh, because the world, the, the space of possible paths is infinite. And you say, I need to look at this infinite space, really of functions, um, space curves that take me from there to there, and look at which one of those functions has the smallest arc length. Um, so there is a machinery for, for proving that. And if you're interested, the course Calculus of Variations, which is a part A short option, and then carries on in some other courses later, develops the machinery to, to answer that. Um, anyway, what we're really interested in is, is the less trivial case of a not, well, a plane is a surface, but a, um, it's a very simple surface. What if I have a non-flat surface? and I want to take the shortest path between two points on the surface where the entire, I, I require that the entire path is embedded, lives on the surface. So here, well, straight line is not even a possibility unless it's flat. So uh, very much less clear what, what the answer is on a, on a curved surface Um, and just the terminology, that shortest path is called a geodesic. Okay. So, well, this machinery that exists in the calculus of variations can be extended to the more generic case. Um, we won't get into the, the theory here. I'm just going to state a, uh, the relevant theorem, which is if we let gamma of S be a curve on a surface, and this is an important point, with arc length parameterization. So S, as we de defined in the last video, S needs to be a parameter that increases at the exact same rate as the arc length of the curve. So arc length parameterization. Then um, the curve gamma is a geodesic. If and only if gamma double prime of s cross n of s is zero, where n of s is a normal vector to the surface. Okay, so second derivative, this is saying that the second derivative uh, following the curve is in the same direction as the normal vector to the surface. Okay. As I said, we're not going to prove that, but we can get a little bit of intuition by thinking about that statement in terms of a plane. So on a plane, go 
back to that problem, but let's draw it again. Well, the key point is that on a plane, the, the normal vector is constant, right? It doesn't depend on uh, where I am on the surface. So I have n here, and a curve living on, this, living on the surface means living on the plane. So there's gamma of s has the property that gamma prime, um, well, gamma prime is the tangent vector, and gamma double prime is the, is the derivative of that. Each of these vectors must live in the plane. So gamma double prime of s is in the plane. Right? This is a vector that is always in the plane. And um, since n is a vector that is not in a plane, gamma double prime cross n is the zero vector if and only if gamma double prime is the zero vector. Right? Because if gamma double prime were not the zero vector, then these, uh, these are not going to be parallel because n is out of the plane and gamma double prime is in the plane. So the only possibility is that uh, an n is not the zero vector. So the only possibility to get a zero is if gamma double prime itself is zero. But that's the same as say, saying that the tangent vector, the derivative of the tangent vector is zero, which means the tangent vector is a constant vector. constant at, that's a bit ugly because that's a vector. I'm going to vector, vectorify the word constant in a, in a wild abuse of notation. Gamma, gamma prime is constant, the tangent vector is constant, that's the same as gamma is a straight line. Okay, so that's, that confirms our, our intuition um, and indeed is a proof, but the proof relied on this theorem, which we've not proven. So there are, there are other ways to prove the statement on a, um, on a plane. Um, okay, so that's, that's the intuition on a plane. Um, let me switch pages here. I want to now think about a sphere. And we're going to do what's well, kind of a fun example. This is example 99 in the typed notes, which I'll write as the following. So we want to compare two paths from 60 degrees. So I'm, I'm going to give two points on, on Earth, right, in terms of latitude and longitude. So suppose I'm at the, I start at the point 60 degrees north, 0 degrees east, which uh, is a slightly funny choice because this is this is somewhere in the North Sea. If you're actually looking at a globe, I don't really, I'm not too bothered about that. That's just a sort of convenient choice of latitude and longitude. And suppose that I want to travel from there to 60 degrees north, 90 degrees east, which geography uh, experts out there will tell you um, is somewhere in Russia. Okay. The two paths I want to consider, path one is, well, we're at 60 degrees north, we're at this particular latitude, and all we're trying to do is change longitude, so let's just, let's just follow that, um, let's just follow that 60 degrees north line. And path two is to follow what's called the great circle, which I'm going to define in a minute. Okay. And what we want to ask by compare, I want to I want to know which of these two paths is the shortest path from there to there. Okay. So path one. What we can do, let's draw a little picture. 
So if that's the North Pole and we're working in spherical coordinates, um, 60 degrees north is the same as dropping uh, what we the angle that we call theta in polar coordinates 30 degrees right because zero degrees would be pointing to the North Pole so we've got a 30 degree uh, in path one we're just staying at that value and circling around from zero to 90 degrees so spherical coordinates and let's take the radius of Earth to be one without loss of generality. You can do this because I'm taking the same um, sphere in each case. In spherical coordinates for path one, what we should do is fix theta, as I said, equal to 30 degrees, which is pi over six radians. And let phi, and phi is our angle swinging around the z-axis, z-axis is the vertical one in this picture, phi range from 0 to pi over 2. It goes from 0 degrees east to 90 degrees east. So here, 0 degrees east, I'm imagining pointing the positive x-axis. And again, we can always rotate things so that that's the case. 0 to pi over 2. Okay, so therefore path 1, which we'll define by gamma 1, and parameter phi is just plugging these values into or this value into the x, y, z of spherical coordinates. You get one half cosine phi, one half sine phi, which is the sine of uh, the one half is coming from the sine of theta, and then the z is just the cosine of theta, which is root three over two. Okay, so we can then compute the arc length as of this space curve as phi goes from zero to pi over two. Our formula we've given in the last video is this is just the integral from zero to pi over two of the magnitude of gamma one prime of phi d phi. And this is a straightforward thing to compute and you get pi over 4, which, because I want to compare actual numerical values, that approximates to 0.785. Okay. So, path 2 is the great circle. And let me define the great circle. This is the circle that passes through two points and contains the center of the sphere. So, for instance, if you took two points on the equator, that the equator is a circle that passes through those two points and contains the center of the sphere. The equator is one great circle. But because there's a rotational symmetry to the sphere, you can always draw such a circle, right? So you can imagine if I take any two other points, I just rotate my sphere so that those two points look like they're sitting on the equator, and then that uh, new equator would be the great circle for those two points, okay? Um, well, generically, a great circle is any circle drawn on the sphere that contains the center of the sphere. Okay. In this picture, so let's draw our, our uh, sphere again. And what we're supposing is that I have, say, point A sitting here. And at this fixed latitude, maybe we put point B right here, and let me, just for labeling, define the center of the sphere by point C. Okay, so path one was this one. The idea of the great circle is that I perform a rotation, or however you want to think of it, such that 
what I see is not a sphere, but a circle. Okay. And of course, if this is a circle that contains the two points and contains, sorry, passes through the points and contains the center of the sphere, then the radius of the circle is not changed. So this is still a circle uh, with radius r, which we've defined to be one. And now, a is say here, b is here, c is the center of that circle, and um, the point is, if I look at this this great circle, then the distance from a to b is is simple uh, simple calculation of geometry, which is that all I need to know is that angle phi. Actually, let me call it. Let me call it, this is called var phi, but that might be a bit confusing. Let me call that alpha, to not confuse it with that phi. If I know that angle phi, then it's clear that that arc length, which would be L2, is radius times angle. Right? So that's R alpha, which is, which is alpha. Okay. So if I can work out the angle between those two, um, then, then I get my answer right away. The way to do that is to say is to, to observe that this vector, call that say vector a, this vector, vector b, these are the same vectors as over here, vector a, vector b. If I can define vectors a and b, which I can via spherical coordinates, then I can take a dot product and work to work out the angle between them. Okay. So by the same ideas up there, vector a is really the starting point. I can use the same spherical coordinates as, as up here. Vector a is just this with uh, phi equal to zero. So that's one half zero root three over two. So that's coming from phi equals zero in gamma one. Vector b is uh, this when phi is pi over two. So we get zero one half root three over two, then taking phi as pi over two. And therefore alpha is the inverse cosine of a dot b, right? Since by construction, these each have magnitude one to the radius. So that's the inverse cosine of this dot this. You just get three over four. And if you work out the inverse cosine of three fourths is approximately 0.72. So what have we shown? Well, um, that tells us L2 is alpha, right? So this is this is L2. This was L1, 0 0.785, 0 0.72. Clearly, L2 is the better path. In fact, we can show that uh, the great circle is uh, always going to be the geodesic on a sphere. Uh, to see that, note that a path on any great circle could be written Well, the same idea. I look at that particular circle and wherever I want to go, say from here to here, I can parameterize by this angle. My path in the great circle is parameterized by this angle, which I'll uh, not to be confused with that phi, I'm just defining, defining it as phi because I'm running out of other variables. That path can be defined as gamma 
of phi equals cosine phi sine phi zero. Okay. This is effectively saying that I do a rotation so that that, that great circle becomes the equator, i.e. z equals zero, and then I do another rotation so that phi equals zero is uh, the starting point of my path, is, is the x-axis, it's pointing the x-axis. Um, and you'll notice that that is an arc length parameterization. Oops. That is an arc length parameterization because the magnitude of gamma prime is identically one. And the other important point in this picture is to note that the normal vector to the sphere is, in this picture, exactly the normal vector to the circle, which is the vector pointing in the radial direction. Okay. So, what I want to do is think about this theorem gamma double prime cross n equals zero, and we can see that gamma double prime of phi is, well, you take two derivatives, you get back to gamma, but with a minus sign, minus gamma of phi, but gamma of phi is uh, the same direction as the normal vector. So that's minus, uh, oops, sorry, minus n. So therefore, gamma double prime cross n is indeed zero on a great circle. So therefore a great circle is a geodesic. Okay, so just small comments. I think these are kind of fun calculations. Um, an airplane is always going to take, well, uh, if we ignore other factors which, which, will, will, which will impact on, on a, an airplane's choice, for instance, jet stream and avoiding certain weather patterns and things like that, airplanes roughly will take great circles. And this is why when you look at the little screen, uh, the map on, on the seat in front of you in an airplane, it sometimes doesn't look like the plane is taking the shortest route, but that's because the screen is flat, and the shortest route on the flat screen is the straight line, but that's ignoring the actual curvature of the Earth, um, which, uh, which is going to have the shortest path of a great circle. Another small comment, if you ever find yourself sitting next to someone or talking to someone who subscribes to flat Earth theory, uh, well, good luck to you. But if you want to convince them that they're wrong, this is really the best way to do so. Ask them to draw their map of flat Earth, and then work out on their on their flat map. You can, it'll be they'll they'll certainly agree that the shortest distance. Pick two points. They'll agree that the shortest distance between those two points is the straight line. It has to be, and then you compute via a calculation like this what the actual uh, shortest distance between those two points is, and then. Tell them to take their path, you take your path, and see who gets there first. Okay, so, <laughs> enough of flat earth, let's, let's do one more example. Um, I want to show show that on a surface of revolution, Meridians, and meridians are defined as the curves with fixed angle are geodesics. Okay, so Our construction, as we recall, is I take a curve in the xy plane, rotate it around the x-axis, and 
And so we get surface like that. And by a meridian, that's taking somewhere, right? There's the distance in the x, and then there's the rotation angle. We fix that angle, that's a meridian. Okay. So here, if we rotate, say, y equals capital F of x about the x-axis, um, and we fix the angle, So if theta is the angle, oops, here, fix a theta equal to say alpha, then we get the curve gamma, which is parameterized just by x, which is x f of x cosine alpha f of x sine alpha. The claim is that that curve is, is a geodesic. So if I want to go of course it's a geodesic that only enables me to go from points that have the same angle, but if that's what um, but the shortest path between two points that have the same angle is to keep that angle fixed. Now what we, would want, what we would want to do is show that gamma double prime cross n equals zero, where n is the normal vector to the surface. The problem is this is not an arc length parameterization. Okay, and you can recall that in the theorem I've given, uh, we, we require an arc length parameterization. So actually what you'll find is that gamma double prime cross n for this choice of gamma is not equal to zero, even though it is in fact a geodesic. So what we need to do is reparameterize the curve, but via an arc length parameterization. Um, so to do that, obtain an arc length parameterization, what we can do is take our curve in the xy plane, and instead of thinking of that curve as y equals f of x, suppose we parameterize that curve as x, y equals f of s, g of s and such that f prime squared plus g prime squared is identically equal to one. In other words, f prime squared plus g prime squared is one for all s, which will make that an arc length parameterization of the planar curve, and if you then rotate that around um, the axis, and fix the angle while you're getting the same curve, so you get an arc length parameterization. So that, that means, with that definition of the planar curve, our surface is parameterized by r of s theta equals f of s g of s cosine theta and g of s sine theta, which follows from the same logic of, of how we got that parameterization, because the radius is still defined by the y value, which is g of s. Okay, that's the surface. A meridian is simply a curve where I fix, again, fix a theta. So that's gamma of s equals r of s, say alpha for fixed alpha. Okay. And now that I have an arc length parameterization of gamma, now what you can do is compute gamma double prime, which is gonna be straightforward. 
and we can also compute n via the cross product dr ds cross dr d theta and then we have to of course fix theta equals alpha um, I'm not going to do this calculation here, it's straightforward enough um, I just want to outline that if you do that then you will indeed find that gamma double prime cross n equals zero and that's for all s okay um, one small note in case you want to try this calculation uh, what you'll find is that for that to work out that relies on or that uses the fact that f prime squared plus g prime squared I'm assuming to be 1 which means that if I take a DDS of that equation I get 2 f prime f double prime plus 2 g prime g double prime equals 0 and that quantity shows up in this calculation but for an arc length parameterization that's 0 and therefore you get the desired result. Okay. And we'll stop there.